If you have your Bibles, we're going to be kicking things off in Genesis chapter 40. That's where we're going to start. And like I said, we are going to cover a lot of ground today talking about the story of Joseph. Joseph's really proven himself to be quite an incredible person. Uh, We know from week one that he was a 17-year-old young boy who lost his mother um, to the birth of his second brother, Benjamin. Benjamin's name means son of my sorrow. And so she died in childbirth, and Joseph doesn't have a mom, but he's got three stepmothers, and he's got a bunch of half-brothers, and the family is simply a mess. (laughs) It's kind of a lot hopefully not, but it's a lot like our families in the sense that no family is perfect. And so Joseph is really coming from a rough background. Well, long story short, we found out that his brother sold him into slavery because they didn't like him because he was daddy's favorite. And so in getting sold into slavery, he gets taken down to Egypt where he ascends into a powerful position, but he gets preyed upon. He's a victim of sexual assault, And the wife of Pharaoh frames him, and Pharaoh believes his wife over Joseph's testimony, and so he gets thrown into prison. And guess how long he's in prison for? 11 years. 11 years! That's ridiculous. Can you imagine being put in prison for something you didn't do, let alone for 11 years? There are a lot of people, actually, unfortunately, who have been accused of crimes And they've been thrown in prison for 30, 40 years. Spent the majority of their adult life in prison for a crime that they didn't commit. And I cannot help but sympathize with Joseph and the fact that I would be incredibly frustrated with God. God, why are you letting this happen to me? This isn't fair. This justice system is rigged. I mean, that's exactly what Joseph is going through. But yet, through Joseph's suffering, God is at work. He's carrying out a providential plan, and God is on the move. Now, let me ask you a question before we kind of jump in. Would you be willing to live dirt poor between the ages of 20 and 30 if you had a lottery ticket that you could cash in for a half a billion dollars? Is that something that you'd be willing to do? 10 years of misery for the rest of your life is, I guess you could say, the most money, eternal bliss. Is that something that you'd be willing to do? Well, Joseph is in prison for, like I said, 11 years, and the guy's having it rough, but good things are going to happen to Joseph despite what he's been through. The first thing that I want to point out this morning is that while Joseph was in prison, like I said, God was on the move, utilizing Joseph to bring about his plan, and there were two people who were put in prison with Joseph after he had served 11 years, and they were two people that were very close to Pharaoh, the cupbearer and uh, the baker. And these two gentlemen end up having dreams in the prison with Joseph, and they begin to talk about their dreams, and they don't know what they mean. And so Joseph comes along, and he says, look, I can interpret your dreams for you. And here's here's the long story short, okay? The cupbearer would be restored to his position because of his dream. The baker was going to die. That's basically what Joseph told these two individuals. And it came to pass. The cup baker was restored to his position, or the the cupbearer was restored to his position. The baker was hanged and put to death. And Joseph only had one request. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. Recognize that I am on God's side. I am on your side. And cupbearer, when you get restored back to your position, don't forget me. Remember me that I'm in this place. I'm in this prison. Let me read to you Genesis chapter 40, verses 14 through 15. Here's the request. Remember me, and when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, so to get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into this pit. In other words, I am innocent. I am on God's side. God is on my side. Please remember me when you get out of this place. And so I would like to think of it like this. Joseph is stuck. Have you ever been stuck in life before? Have you ever felt like you're stuck in a relationship or you're stuck with your family like Joseph was? You're stuck at your job. You're just simply stuck in life. I mean, here's a guy in prison for 11 years for something he didn't do, and he fits the classical definition of being stuck in life. But yet he serves God faithfully. He still tries to do the right thing. I can remember, you know, you look back at earlier moments in your life, 
And when you look back at those earlier moments that really mattered and were really important, now they don't seem so important. But there was one specific time earlier in my 20s, I was serving at a different congregation, and um, I was working two jobs, but I wanted to be involved in a Christian debate that during, during the week time. And so it was going to last for four nights, but it was about an hour and a half away. I lived in what's called Winchester, Virginia. It's kind of like at the point of Virginia. And then James Madison University is where this event was going to be held. And it was held about an hour and a half south. And so every day I would work my part-time job and then I would get off and I would drive down. So it would be three hours of driving. Mostly I was utterly exhausted, but I really wanted to be there because I was not only wanting to watch the event, but I was going to participate in it. I was going to help with it. And so, and so here I am driving down every day, participating in this event. It lasted several hours, so I didn't end up getting home until early hours of the morning. Well, on the last night, it was finally over, and it lasted, you know, several hours. And so there I stood, 11 o'clock, and we were fellowshipping, and we were hanging out with each other, and we were asking each other questions, you know, to kind of get clarification of what took place during the debate. And, uh, and I stayed there the longest because I'm a talker, if you haven't noticed yet. If you've been here for any amount of time, you'll know I can talk. And so I'm a preacher after all. And so here I am hanging out, fellowshipping. I'm like one of the last people to leave, and I go to find my jacket, and my jacket's gone. Not a big deal, but it was a big deal because my keys were in my jacket. And so here I am, exhausted, it's getting into the early hours of the morning, my jacket is nowhere to be found, and all I can think is somebody took it. And so naturally, I'm actually starting to get angry at this point at whoever took my jacket, right? Did they do it on purpose? Was it an accident? Well, what boiled my anger even more is here I am calling everybody that was there at the debate that night, and nobody is answering the phone. I'm stuck at James Madison University, an hour and a half away from home. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. It's been a long week. Nobody's answering their, my phone calls, and there I am, stuck. Looking back now, it's kind of funny. But at the time, it was not funny at all. It was, I was like, where did my wife put my keys at? <laughs> Well, finally, I called my preacher. It was, you know, imagine getting a phone call at 12 you know, o'clock at night and uh, called my preacher back home and he talked with me and prayed with me and he told me something that I'll never forget. It's not a Bible verse, but it's somebody who's been through stuff before. It's experience. This too shall pass. And even though I felt stuck, that was exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. This to shall pass. And the idea is built off of the biblical principle that our seasons are momentary. It's not going to last forever, especially in view of eternity with God. And so finally, I keep calling, I keep calling, I keep calling. Well, <laughs> my friend who was another preacher, accident, his wife accidentally picked up my jacket by mistake. She took it home. He finally figured it out. He comes back to the college, gives me my jacket and my keys, and I get to go home. But that was so, such an intense moment for me, and I was so upset, but this too shall pass. And you know that phrase has stuck with me even up to this day, and I have gone through a whole lot worse than just somebody taking my keys at a college late at night. Life is tough. Life is really difficult. And if there is anything that Joseph is holding on to, it's this idea that this too shall pass. The Lord is with me. God has a plan. He's on the move. And you know, when I think about Joseph being stuck in this situation, I can't help but think of Romans chapter five, verses three through four. It says this. It says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And that's what Joseph is clinging on to, hope. Hope for a better future. Hope for a better tomorrow. Hope that God is going to work things out for his good. And you know, in that moment, even though it was a small affliction for me, it refined my character. I grew from that one moment in college and every single trial that has come my way, I have grown in character, which has produced endurance. Look, if I can go through some of the things that I've been through over the last 12 years, I can handle quite a bit. And I think a lot of you who have lived for any amount of time can say the exact same thing. You get stronger through your suffering. It produces an endurance in you. And looking back, no, there's no wonder my preacher was able to say, this too shall pass. It was so real. It was the biggest thing in the world to me at that time. But like I said, he's been through stuff before. And so he was able to tell me, Rick, this is going to pass. Put this into perspective. And here we are looking at the life of Joseph, trying to say, Joseph, put 11 years in prison into perspective. A lot easier said than done, right? But God is on the move. 
Well, guess what? The cupbearer gets restored back to his position. You think he remembers Joseph? No. Two more years in prison. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I mean, a couple days, sure. Two more years? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. He is forgotten about. I mean, can you imagine how frustrating that would be to God? It's like me sitting at James Madison University for two more hours. This guy gets two more years. I mean, come on. You want to talk about frustration. He would be utterly frustrated, or would he? Well, guess what? Something happens. Pharaoh has a dream. And in Pharaoh's dream, he has this appearance that takes place and there's a bunch of symbols that take place and he has no idea what they mean and nobody can interpret the dream. But then the cupbearer remembers, ah, there was a guy in prison, a Hebrew, his name was Joseph. And he was able to interpret my dream and perhaps he will be able to interpret your dream as well. And so he calls Joseph before Pharaoh and Joseph is able to interpret the dream. And here's the short version. Pharaoh Egypt is going to undergo seven years of plenty. You're going to have so much food, you won't even know what to do with it all. But then seven years of famine is going to take place. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And Pharaoh is so moved by Joseph's interpretation of the dream. Here's what the Bible says. It says in Genesis chapter 41, verses 9 through 13, this is the cupbearer talking. He said, I remember my offenses. He's like, I wasn't supposed to forget Joseph, but I did. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and he put the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain guard. And when we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And he has interpreted it to us. And so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. And Joseph comes in and does the exact same thing to Pharaoh, interprets the dream. And look at, look at what Pharaoh says in Genesis 41, 38. Can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? God was on the move in the midst of Joseph's suffering. And God can be on the move in the midst of yours. The end of your story It's not the suffering that you endure. The end of your story is the hope that is yet to be revealed. And so as you go through difficult moments in your life, don't lose perspective that God is willing out his good plan for you. Now that has an eternal perspective. That doesn't mean God promises us health and wealth in this life. It's our eternal perspective. We're gonna get to that in a few moments. And so guess what? Famine came. And guess who God appointed with the authority to oversee this entire process, Joseph. Just like that, in a matter of time, he goes from the pits of prison back up to the mountaintops of the political power, and he becomes the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. In fact, there was only one person more powerful than he, and it was Pharaoh. And so Joseph oversaw the seven years of good, and he oversaw the seven years of famine. And here come the seven years of famine, where we're going to pick up our story in Genesis chapter 41. Here's what it says. Not only did Egypt undergo a famine, look at what verse 57 says. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt, to, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe all over the earth. So it's not just an Egyptian problem, it becomes a worldwide problem. And guess what happens? Joseph's brothers return to Egypt so that they are able to buy grain from Joseph. Do you remember from week one when Joseph had a dream, 17 years old? Everybody was going to bow down to him, his brothers, and they couldn't stand it. In fact, they wanted to kill him for it. And so here it is coming to pass 13 years later. Joseph is 30 years old, 17, 13 years in prison, 30 years old, the second most powerful man in the earth, and here come his brothers back. This is a very, very passionate story that will invoke some of your emotions if you can understand and feel what's about ready to take place. And so Joseph's family comes to Egypt to purchase food. And here's what the Bible says in Genesis 42. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was one who sold all to the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Ah, prophecy fulfilled. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. I mean, come on. Would we not do the same thing? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith Rick, right? (laughs) That's the King James Version of Romans 12, by the way. But he's speaking roughly to them. They don't recognize him. Here's what it says. 
Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers, spoke roughly to them. Where did you come from, he said. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. After all, they probably thought he was dead. And so Joseph devises a plan. He sells them grain. He takes their money, but here's what he does. He has his followers put their silver back in the bags and send them on their way. And you know what he does? He accuses them of being spies. You guys are spies in our land. How did you get your money back? And they're like, we have no idea how this money came back to us. We are innocent, I promise. And he says, no, you're spies. So here's what I'm gonna do. Do you have a father? Yeah. Do you have any other siblings? We have a younger brother back in the land of Canaan. I wanna see him, bringing back down to me. Joseph knows Benjamin is the only special son left that Jacob, his father, has. And in order to guarantee their return, he holds back one of the brothers and says, unless you come back, I will not release you back home. And they are devastated. How could this possibly happen? In fact, one of the brothers says, this is God repaying us back for what we did to Joseph. Conviction like that. You ever had one of those moments where you're like, oh my goodness, this is what this is the result of what I did 10 years ago. <laughs> That's exactly what the brothers are thinking. God is paying us back. And so they go back home and guess what? They ask Jacob, well, we need to take Benjamin back down to Egypt because we were falsely accused of spies and he kept one of our brothers, Simeon. Unless we go back, unless we go back, he's not gonna release him. He's gonna die down in Egypt and Jacob is so overwhelmed. He is so discouraged and he says, no. You are not taking Benjamin back. Sorry, older brother. I'm not giving up my only unique special son, Benjamin, as an exchange, not gonna take place. Well, guess what? Seven years of famine lasts a pretty long time. They run out of food. And guess what they have to do? They have to go back to Egypt. <laughs> you wanna talk about rotten luck for the brothers. A lot of us would say karma, even though I don't believe karma is a biblical doctrine, right? You reap what you sow. Um, that's what the Bible teaches. But here it's coming full circle. Joseph has devised a plan and he's not gonna let him get out of it this time. And so Benjamin has to go down to Egypt, Jacob's special, unique son. And here's what Jacob basically tells his brothers. If Benjamin dies, if anything happens to him, this is gonna be a death sentence for me. And here's what he tells his sons in Genesis 43, 14. May God Almighty grant you mercy before this man. And may he send back your brother and Benjamin and as for me, I am bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. If you ever lost somebody that you love, you can understand what Jacob's going through. He has, he's lost somebody very special to him, his favorite wife. It's like, man, you got three others, but it's, he's still hurt by that. This is the one that he wanted. Okay? He was tricked in the other things, and that's a different story. And then he lost his favorite son, and he's devastated. And so he finally has to relent. He gives Benjamin up to his sons, and here's... And here's what happens. Benjamin goes down with his brothers and Joseph prepares a huge feast for these guys. He gives their donkeys food and water. He takes care of them. He restores them. And this whole time, they're thinking in the back of their minds, man, this might be the kisses of an enemy. You know how politicians like to sweet talk you. Meanwhile, they're stabbing you in the back. That's probably exactly what they're thinking about Joseph, right? He's the most powerful man in the world. What is he doing preparing a feast for people that he charges spies? Well, the story gets even better. When they came to Joseph, they bowed down before him once again, and he inquired about his father. How's your father doing? How's the old man that we talked about a few years ago? Well, he's still alive, but frankly, he's devastated. Because if he loses Benjamin, and if he loses us, what else does he have to live for? Benjamin was really all that Jacob felt like he had left. And so he says, I want to see Benjamin. And Benjamin comes in and Joseph is so overwhelmed with sorrow. He is so overwhelmed with sadness that he actually has to leave the scene and go and he weeps. Here's what the Bible says. Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew more for his brother and he sought a place to weep and he entered his chamber and he wept there. And they heard, they heard Joseph weeping. His servants heard, heard Joseph weeping. That's how sad Joseph is about this whole thing that's taken place. Now, how many of us would have this kind of compassion? How many of us would be ready to crack the whip the moment we saw the very people who sold us out? 
You don't have to raise your hand, but I can tell you right now, it'd be very difficult for me to forgive people that sold me into slavery and I had to serve a 13-year prison sentence. Wouldn't that be difficult for you? That'd be difficult for me. But yet he grows in compassion at the sight of his brother. God breaks down the barriers of his own heart and he has mercy on them. And you know what? This is what the Bible calls us to have. The Bible calls us to love our enemies. People that have betrayed us, it could even be your own family. The Bible calls us to love our enemies. Here's what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter five. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. You know, something that is infecting our culture is this idea of cancel culture. And here's what it means. If you do anything good, I'm gonna search through your historical life. I'm gonna look at every tweet, every Facebook post, and I'm gonna ruin anything that you try to do good. That is a culture in which we live. I think it was just last week or two weeks ago, there was a young man holding up a sign at college game day. I'm a huge college football fan, right? Ohio State Buckeyes, of course, the greatest team in America for college sports. But anyways, that's a beside the point. <sighs> yeah, I can hear some amens, that's good. And so he's holding up this sign, now granted, okay, he's asking for a drink that we would not recommend him to drink. But regardless, he says, I need money for my drink. And so a bunch of people send him money. He gets 400 bucks before he knows it. Next thing you know, it grows to even hundreds more. And so he's like, you know what? I could do so much better with this money than just buy my favorite liquid with it. And so he decides to donate the money. He's, he, he's in Iowa, okay? And overlooking Iowa University is this children's hospital. And so they get to look out the window and they get to watch the games. And so he decides to donate whatever money that he raised is going to go to this children's hospital. And it catches social media by storm. He raises like tw over $20,000 for this. Well, some reporter out in Colorado or wherever it is decided to look up this guy's tweets from back at the time he was 16 years old. Ruined the entire thing, right? People who were sponsoring him decided to break the relationship because they couldn't be associated with somebody who said some bad things back when they were 16 years old. I mean, come on, 16 years old. It's a, it's a teenager. It's a, it's a student. People make mistakes, believe it or not. Cancel culture, man. You can't do anything good, and if you do, we're going to destroy your life. Well, guess what happened? Because this reporter dug into his history, other reporters dug into the reporter's history, and the guy ended up losing his job and getting fired. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Can we please have some grace and compassion for people and the mistakes that they make in their lifetime? Can we please not always dig into the past of our relationships, of people who are trying to do good things just to bring destruction upon their life? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about this here in a few minutes, but the point is simply this. Is this the kind of world that we wanna live in where we repay evil for evil. Joseph had the perfect opportunity to give his brothers what they rightfully deserved, and he didn't. He chose to love them, and then he finally reveals himself, and so here's what he does. He devises a plan to see if his brothers have changed. He sells them the grain, fills up their bags, gives them their money back, unbeknowing to them, and then he takes his silver cup and he places it in the bag of Benjamin and he sends them on their way, and he sends his chariots and his guards after them, and they arrest Joseph's brothers, and they search through their bags, and guess what they find? The silver cup. So guess who has to come down to Egypt? Benjamin, he's gotta come back. And the brothers are devastated, and finally he puts Judah to the test. And Judah says, look, we've made mistakes. If you take Benjamin, this will be a death sentence for our father, and Joseph breaks. He reveals himself to his brothers. Here's what the Bible says. This is what he tells his brothers in Genesis 44. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, uh, this is Judah, my father, and the boy is not with us. Then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. In other words, he's gonna die. And so here's what Joseph does. And I, I want to read this to you. It's 15 verses long, but it's such a good part of the story. It says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so loud the Egyptian heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. 
And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. I am, is my father still alive? I mean, you can almost feel the, the tension in his voice, the hurt in his voice. Is dad still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. You want to talk about a shocker. It's me all along. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And when they came near, he punched them in the gut. <laughs> That's what I would do. Come here, let me give you a hug. Ah! <laughs> That's not what he does. It says, when they came near, he said, I am your brother Joseph, who you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Can you imagine saying something like this? For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. So it's only two years into the famine, five more to go. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. You see, God is working out his redemptive plan through Joseph. There has to be a remnant, a group of people left over. Why? Ultimately, the Messiah is going to come, and it's going to be through the bloodline of Israel or Jacob. 12 tribes of Israel, Judah, ultimately will produce the Messiah. But there's also another perspective. It's not just about the long-term vision of the Messiah, but it's about saving people's lives through the famine. And here's what it goes on to say. And so it was not you who sent me here, but God. What a tough pill to swallow. When we finally recognize that God permitted certain things to happen that were tremendously painful for us, that's a tough pill to swallow because we kind of get a different perspective of God. That God isn't the God of health and wealth. God is the God of somebody who will permit me to go through tough, difficult circumstances. In fact, for Joseph, not for everybody in here, okay? Because remember, we talked about the difference between God's permissive will and providential will. God is working specifically through Joseph. For the majority of us in here, God permits things to happen based on our free will choice. But through Joseph and through his brothers, God has orchestrated a plan and he has actually sent Joseph to Egypt through his providence and during the suffering to save lives and to produce a remnant for eventually the Messiah to come. And he is so wise and he has so much perspective on what he's gone through. He says, look, this was part of God's plan and I've accepted it. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all of his house, and ruler over the land of Egypt. Hurry up, go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord over all of Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall bear near, be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. Come, dad, come bring everything. I want you to live with me. Gives me chills. There I will provide for you. And there yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. Come live with me, dad. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. And you must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt. Still wants his dad to be proud of him. It's a good thing. We want our fathers to be proud of us. And it goes on to say this, you must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen, hurry and bring my father down here. And then he fell upon his brother, brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. I mean, just a complete emotional roller coaster. So overwhelmed, he's weeping on Benjamin's neck, his younger brother, and it says he kissed all of his brothers and he wept on them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. And this was, of course, a cultural thing. They would kiss each other. Uh, Paul said, greet each other with a holy kiss. Aren't you glad that that's a cultural thing? I don't want to be kissed by you guys. I mean, that would just be weird. <laughs> well, that's something that they did, okay? It'd be, it'd be like us shaking hands. No kisses. That's weird. I just kissed my family. That's it. Uh, but that's, that's exactly what's going on here. And here's the deal. God is at work. And Joseph sees this. It is not you who sent me here, but it is God. God is working out the good in Joseph's life. And ultimately, we can extend this principle to us. God is working out the good in your life. It may not be specifically with what's going on here. He may not put you to be the second most powerful person in the United States of America, but God is willing your good and the plan of redemptive history. He has worked out your salvation. He has set a plan for you to be saved. Here's what Romans says. 
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That even though God has let you go through what you go through, he is still working out your ultimate good to spend eternity in heaven with him. And for those of you who have, you've lost in Christ, God is working out your good. And secondly, I think Joseph knows this, God's bigger plan is at work. Ultimately, it's pointing towards Jesus. And that's why Paul goes on to say in Romans eight twenty nine, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Predestination is not a dirty word. God predestines according to his foreknowledge of our free will choice. God predestines, maps out in advance his plan according to his knowledge of our free will choice of whether or not we will accept or reject Christ. Before God ever created or planned the world, he knew whether or not you would freely reject Christ or accept Christ. And so predestination is a biblical teaching, but it's based on the foreknowledge of God and not some arbitrary decision. Well, you half are in hell, you half are in heaven. So be it. That's not predestination, and that's not the sovereignty of God. See, God is working out your good because you love him, and you're called according to his purpose, and he wants a relationship with you. And so Paul goes on to say this. He also predestined us to do what? To be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. And so just like God working out Joseph's story to save Egypt and even a lot of people in the world, so God is working out his plan to save us because of our free will choice that we would choose to love him. And then the most climatic episode in the story happens. Joseph is reunited with his father. Look at what the Bible says. Jacob eventually comes down to live in Goshen with his son and with his brothers. And it says, then Joseph prepared a chariot, couldn't stand it, couldn't wait for dad to come. And so he has to go meet him. And he went to meet Israel, his father in Goshen, and he presented himself and fell on his neck and he wept over his neck a while. And so Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face and I know that you are still alive. Man, what a climatic part to this story. He is finally reunited. You know what? I couldn't help but make the comparison that that's what's gonna be like when this earth fades away and we get to see all of those who we lost in the Lord and we are reunited. And I'm sure there will be tears of joy and we are finally with those whom we lost. What a beautiful picture of that. And then eventually Jacob dies and they mourn for 70 days. Can you imagine a funeral procession, 70 days? Well, Joseph is the second most powerful man in the kingdom. And when his father Jacob dies, there's a big funeral and a celebration over the life of Jacob. But his brothers couldn't help get rid of their guilty conscience. You know what they said? Now that dad's dead, we're in trouble. I mean, he probably only treated us this way. It wasn't really genuine. He just did it so that he could be reunited with dad. And so here's what the Bible says, and this is what we'll end with. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. And so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command, <clears throat> liars, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of your servants, of the God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And so his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. We can't do anything. We are at your mercy. And look at what happens. Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? And then my favorite Bible verse in the entire Old Testament right here. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are here today. And so do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Let me promise you this, no amount of evil can undo the good that God has predestined for you in Christ. Not angels, not demons, 
not presidents, not principalities, not powers. The only person who can undo the good that God has planned for you is you if you choose that you don't want it. That's it. But I can't help but admire Joseph, his perspective on life, 13 years in prison, coming out ready and willing to forgive, ready to restore, ready to love, ready to move on. Now, before we end, I think it's important to read this passage of scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. It says, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Have you been hurt? Have you been betrayed? Have you been let down? Have you been forsaken? Have you been stabbed in the back? Don't repay evil for evil. Seek to do good to everyone. But that doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. That doesn't mean you have to place yourself in a situation to be continually abused and manipulated and hurt. We can certainly forgive, but forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Forgiveness does not mean you continue to place yourself in a situation in order for you to be abused and hurt again. Oh no, if somebody hurts you, if somebody breaks the law, God is going to take vengeance on his own behalf. We are not called to take personal vengeance, but that doesn't excuse wrongdoing. If somebody hurts my child, I may forgive them, but that doesn't mean I want my child to be around them anymore. And that doesn't mean they don't deserve to go to prison for hurting my daughter. Are you with me? And so that's why Romans chapter 12 says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. If somebody comes through these doors right now to try to hurt our church, you can best believe that I'm gonna do everything I can to live at peace. But if they seek to hurt and destroy the people of this congregation, they will be hurt before they can hurt others. If it's possible, but I will defend myself and I will defend you. I will defend my family and you have the right to defend yourself. But ultimately, here's what's most important. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. This is so very important. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hate can't cast out hate. But at the same time, God is going to punish evil. And he does that two ways. The first way that he's going to do it is through civil authority. If you go on to read Romans 13, there's a reason Romans 12 and 13 are connected together. God carries out vengeance through the authority of the government. He punishes sin through the local authority. If somebody hurts my daughter, while I may not carry out vengeance, even though I'd want to, I can hand this over to the civil government and the authorities to prosecute this person to the fullest extent of the law. That's the first way that God carries out justice. The second way is in eternity. God ultimately must punish sin and hell cannot escape that, time, that kind of punishment. And so I shouldn't stand in the path of God's wrath. I need to step to the side and let the Lord handle it through civil authority or ultimately through the eternal judgment. But I think Joseph is the most remarkable character in all of the Old Testament. Hurt, betrayed, always loves, always follows, tries to do the best job that he possibly can in any circumstance. What is God's plan for your life? Ultimately is that you would trust him, that you would have a relationship with him, that you would be in Christ, and that the eternal relationship with God would be brought into perspective of your story, that you would abstain from sexual immorality, just like Joseph did, that you would love God and love people, that you would forgive your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, but you would still uphold justice and integrity of the law, that you would try to do right and good to everyone in your life, but ultimately you would have a relationship with Jesus. Will you make that free will choice today? Will you make that decision? I'm going to obey the gospel. I'm going to follow Jesus. The plan is simple. Turn away from your sin be baptized in water in Jesus' name and live your life faithful unto him all your days. It's as simple as that.